Hello everyone and welcome to Today I'm going to answer that question you've always wanted answered but kept forgetting to look up. That's right. What is Prussia? You hear the word Prussia every now and then and wonder, what on earth is that? And you ask and someone's like, well, you know, it was this so many, how many, blah, 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 who knows what they're talking about. Well, calm down, friend, and get nice and cosy, because I'm going to answer it with splendiferous simplicity. Ready? First, it's wrong to ask what is Prussia, because it's no longer around. It used to be around, but now it isn't. Where was it, you ask? Well, there. Later it ended up as big as this, right smack in the middle of Europe. And the easiest way to answer the titular question is to say, before 1871, before that year, pay attention, before 1871, Germany was not unified. It was made up of many, 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 many small principalities and states and duchies and kingdoms. And Prussia was the biggest one. Okay, but let's get a little more depth here, shall we? Let's get the background and some further thorough info, eh? Prussia was not always that big, or even German. Why was it called Prussia, anyway? Well, that's simple. The original inhabitants of the land were called the Old Prussians. At least, that's what we call them. The Prussians were never a united people, but rather a series of separate tribes. So rather than collectively call themselves Prussian, they were Sudovian, Batian, or Galindian, etc. Sort of how the Greeks were Athenian, Spartan, Theban, Corinthian, and so on. Anyway, the Prussian people were possibly the same as the people known as the Aisti to the Roman historian Tacitus, and referred to in his book on ancient Germany. Not only does the geography match up, sort of, but these same Aisti were referred to as Brus by a Bavarian geographer in the 800s AD. Brus, Prus, Prussia... It's feasible. Now these Prussians were not a Germanic people, like, say, the Saxons, Goths, or Swaby, but a Baltic people who spoke a Baltic language. Baltic languages are related to Slavic languages, but of course quite different. And the only two that survive today are Latvian and Lithuanian. The Baltic peoples were, I think, the last peoples in Europe to accept Christianity. They lived, traded, fought, and repulsed Polish invasions until the 1200s. By this time, the Catholic Church had just about had enough of these bothersome Baltic brutes and decided to double down and Christianize them. Of course, the Church set about converting in a very unchristian way by force. Forget that Jesus said, put down the sword to Peter. Forget all that. In 1230, the Prussians experienced the beginning of a nightmare that lasted some 60 years and essentially saw them devastated beyond recovery. Essentially, the German Teutonic Knights were called in, among the most feared and menacing orders in history. The Prussians put up a heroic fight, but eventually the German Knights proved too powerful and they conquered the land and the surrounding regions as well, establishing their own state, which they themselves ruled. German and Dutch settlers entered and colonized the region. And the Poles were keen on getting a slice of it too. Surrounding regions began to be classed as Prussia from around 1310, to simplify things, I suppose. Thus Prussia became much bigger than it ever was originally, and it became less and less Baltic and more and more Germanic. Now the Germans did not just conquer the land and leave it to rot. They actually built it up and made it rich and prosperous. Here's the castle at Malbrook, for instance. Another view of it? A cathedral here. And this here was a castle they built in Königsberg. Not bad, huh? But if you plan on going to visit it, forget it. Just forget it. Get that idea out of your head. Get it out, I say. Why, you ask? Well, because it no longer exists. The British destroyed it in World War II. Yep, a bunch of Avro Lancasters bombed the city to rubble and countless cultural treasures went up in smoke. Yay! Anyway, the Teutonic Knights persisted in gobbling up more land, and this led to wars against Poland. Now, it's a big advantage for a country to have access to the sea, as it means more trade, which means more wealth. Imagine the horrors of Poland after it lost its only connection to the sea, when the Teutonic Knights brutally captured the city of Gdańsk in 1308. The Polish king Władysław I had asked the Teutonic Knights to help him get the region, but once they got it, they kept it for themselves. Years went by and the Polish kings got angrier and angrier at the loss. Finally, the Pope himself stepped up and said, yeah, hand it over, guys. And so the Teutonic Knights said, nope. Yep, they kept it. And of course, there was war. The Polish-Teutonic War ended with an armistice, but with the Germans having the upper hand and keeping the seaports that Poland so much wanted. This pesky thing about access to the Baltic Sea would be one of the biggest thorns in the side of German-Polish relations for centuries. There followed nearly 70 years of peace until some uprisings against the Germans by a Lithuanian people known as the Samogitians, beginning in 1401. By 1409, the uprisings mushroomed into an actual war after the Teutonic Knights threatened to invade Lithuania. Lithuania at this time was closely allied with Poland, and both nations did not think too highly of this threat. The Teutonic Knights suffered a crushing defeat at the Battle of Grunwald in 1410, one of the biggest battles of medieval Europe. This here is the field where the battle took place. Just imagine, tens of thousands of men clashing in the broad green fields under a bright blue midsummer sky, heaving under heavy armour in the heat as the banners billowed in the air and the cavalry charged, swords unsheathed and... Sorry, it's easy to get carried away by imagining the epic battles of the past. Anyway, the Polish and Lithuanians eventually won, and you could argue they deserved it, 
as the Teutonic Knights had been rather arrogantly sure of victory, their leader, Grandmaster Ulrich von Jungingen, even sent two swords to the Polish and Lithuanian leaders to help them in battle, along with a mock polite message designed to anger them. Anyway, the Teutonic Knights blamed the loss on the knight Nikolaus von Rheins, who was accused of lowering his banner, a retreat signal that led to a panic and loss of morale, and swayed the battle against them. The knights executed him and all his male descendants. Now, while the Teutonic Knights reeled from the blow of this defeat, they didn't lose much, geographically speaking, but they were forced to pay a crippling amount of money in silver, which meant they had to raise taxes, which meant people became angry, which meant they revolted. The Thirteen Years' War happened. A bunch of Prussian cities and nobles rebelled against the Teutonic Knights in a desire to join Poland. The Teutonic Knights aggressively sought to quench this rebellion, and were in rare form for the first half. In the 1450s, they seemed unstoppable. They marched onward, crushing the Poles at battles like Kurnitz, and retaking numerous cities and castles. Poland was in deep trouble, though fresh Polish forces arriving in Prussia from the home country and innumerable mercenaries helped sway the war, especially after the Polish victory at the Battle of Sevecino. The second piece of thorn was signed after the war. Poland got the western half of Prussia, called Western Prussia, and later renamed Royal Prussia, thus giving them their long-desired view of the Baltic Sea. Eastern Prussia stayed under Teutonic control, but as a vassal of Poland. This basically meant the Teutonic Knights were reduced to the status of tenants in Prussia to the Polish crown. But this wasn't the end for the Germans in Prussia. In 1525, during the Reformation, the last Grand Master of the Teutonic Knights, Albrecht von brandenburg ansbach swapped his title for Duke of Prussia and became a Protestant. Thus, Eastern Prussia became the Duchy of Prussia and the first Protestant state in history, and it was to be ruled over by the noble German Hohenzollern family of Brandenburg. In 1618, the Duchy of Prussia joined the Margraviate of Brandenburg, boosting their strength, though they suffered greatly from the Thirty Years' War. In 1657, the Germans got total control of the Duchy of Prussia from Poland via the Treaty of Bromberg in exchange for helping Poland in their war against Sweden. Now, the latter 1600s is when we see the Prussian military really make a name for itself. The Duchy of Prussia was elevated into the Kingdom of Prussia, with Frederick I as the first king, and all the lands ruled by the House of Hohenzollern became known as Prussia, Prussen, and Prussia got stronger and stronger, becoming a feared and respected player on the European stage. The man who truly forged Prussia into a great power was Frederick II, known as the Great. What a face. Great sorrow, great vision. A troubled, intelligent, complex man, equally as fond of military action as he was of music and philosophy. He modernized his kingdom, strengthened the army into the most efficient and organized military force in Europe. A tactician of genius who personally led his men into battle, Frederick was also an accomplished flautist who wrote symphonies and sonatas, more than a hundred sonatas for the flute in fact, and had a sumptuous summer palace where he could relax in the gardens or recline with a cup of coffee in a humble room like this. Now remember when Poland got the western bit of Prussia and it was called Royal Prussia? Well, Frederick took it. That's right. He thus got all of historic Prussia and it was joined to the rest of his German kingdom, which was all also called Prussia, and which not long after his death became as big as this. Frederick thus built up the country, nearly doubled its size by war, oversaw the powerful update to the army, making Prussia a land few would want to mess with. Anyway, Prussia declined a little after Frederick, and thus had a hard time against Napoleon, but it strengthened again under Moltke the Elder, who led the Prussian armies in a war with France, in which the French were defeated. This was also the age of Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor of Prussia. This shrewd, clever, sagacious, and strong-willed man orchestrated the unification of Germany. After hundreds and hundreds of years, the various German states, except Austria, at last joined together as one. And the ambitions of this newly unified Germany were not at all modest. This was not going to be a kingdom of Germany, but an empire. Wilhelm I became Kaiser, German for Caesar, and the story of Prussia now pretty much becomes entangled with that of the rest of Germany. In 1918, Prussia ceased being a kingdom, and status-wise was reduced to simply being a state. After World War II, in 1947, Prussia was dissolved. Why did the victors of the war want Prussia gone? One reason was that they viewed it as a trouble spot, the historic German powerhouse, which, if left to recover, might arise again to threaten them. Poland got this, and Soviet Russia got that, and all the Germans were kicked out. So, in summary, Prussia was a Baltic land that became a German land that became a split German-Polish land that became a German land that became incredibly powerful, that was dissolved, and that is now no more. <gasps>